to have it interesting and have a whole different kind of architectural look to it than either the Klingons or the Starfleet craft. Uh, its own coloration, its own shapes, to be more Vulcan. So all those things were part of uh, the intercollaborative thing, but it all started with my design team, and then we just changed things when we needed to. There was a small uh, model of the Enterprise that's like a foot long uh, that had lights and things in it that was for all the long shots. You know, when the thing's far away, you know, when you have a model that's, uh, you know, close to 10 feet long, and you want it to look small, you, you know, you can't get far enough away from it to get it small. So, uh, and then there are other parts of the, of the Enterprise. The dock, uh, the door where the shuttle docks with it was a separate piece that was much larger that married up to the size of the, of the shuttle that brought Kirk up. That shuttle was designed so that that was rear projection of them inside. So I was projecting through the back onto a, a, a rear projection screen inside, and then there was the real glass in the front and so forth, which is a technique that was used in 2001. And so, we're, so we refined it a little bit more. So there were things like that that were part of the, uh, the design of everything, the, that the functions were a part of it. Uh, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, we're, we're kind of winding down now. After all of this, did you become a Star Trek fan? <laughs> uh, I um, I don't go to watch the new Star Wars. I mean Star Trek movies. I feel that uh, you know it's it's like a religion, you know, and uh, I'm not religious, so uh, <laughs> I basically um, I thought the movie turned out based on the production schedule and, you know, when Doug took over and all the stuff they had to get done, but I thought it was shot well. And I liked the look of the movie um, and so forth. There were story points and things that, that I still have problems with. I, the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in film was putting that red glowing thing on Leah's neck. My God, I, uh, that's a whole story into itself um, because it had to actually physically be there on her. We could not track that and mat it onto her. And I, they literally had to have a glowing thing on her neck that didn't have a necklace around it or any kind of thing that went around her neck at all. It had to be right there on her throat and glowing. Well, that's really hard to do in 1979. Uh, and I was responsible for that. And, and to make that thing work on camera when you're shooting and it, when it would had all these grain of wheat lights in it and these, you know, like hearing aid batteries, these tiny batteries. So it had, it would, I could turn one of them on. So I had multiples of them. We had to put them on her because you couldn't have any wires going around that you could see. In the wide shots, we did. There were little really fine wire that went around her neck with makeup over it that we, we could get away with. But in any of the close or medium shots, we had to literally put it on there, turn it on, glue it to her, get out of the scene, director, action. They do, No, that wasn't good. Can we do another take of that? And then the thing would burn out. Oh, yeah. Was so it? It, it wouldn't stay on long. And everybody on the crew, the director, the director, of photography, everybody hated it. And therefore, they hated me. Because where's Taylor? Get that another light on there, my God! Uh, you know it was just incredible. And you know I said a couple times to Rodney, can't we make that thing have like some really high tech thing that was around her neck? Then I could have put batteries in. I could have made something that lasted. You know, uh, had multiple, but no, he wouldn't have it. Oh. So anyway, uh, there were things like that in the making. But going back, am I a Star Trek fan? Yes, somewhat. I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, dedicated to it uh, at all. And since they now have new captains and new, you know, I just don't follow along the franchise. I feel the same way about the Star Wars movies. I mean, you know, it's like how many candy stores can you make? The first one was the best one, as far as I'm concerned, and then the first three were the best, and then everything after that, it's just and they just keep cranking them out. And to me, they're all the same, you know, and that's the way Star Trek is. It's like a franchise and they will, you know, I thought Wrath of Khan was really pretty good. Um, you know, some of the others just, uh, again, got really silly. You know? um, okay. Well, so I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, not try I'm not trying to pin you down. 
let's just move on and talk about Tron because there are myriads of Tron fans and you moved from Starfleet to the inner workings of a computer game. So as we wind up, I'm kind of wondering where did the inspiration for that come from? How did you imagine the interior of a computer game would look if you were an electron moving through the circuits? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that movie was really magic to work on and really fun to work on because I, let me just say one thing really quickly. Making of Star Trek was a movie made by committee. Okay. There were, when I would bring in a designs for anything, there would be 12 people in the room. Uh, uh, and I would put a drawing up of the work bee and I would have say 12 drawings. Workies. And I soon learned at the very beginning that if I put the one I really liked up there first, there was no way it was ever going to be the one that was picked because they would go into this debate among themselves, which I just couldn't believe it. There were people talking about things they had no idea. They'd say, well, that isn't what happened when something goes to the speed of light. Here's what happened. And Roddenberry would say, no, this is what happened when things go to the speed of light. And we'd have astronauts there, and he would say, no, that, you know, astronauts would say, well, that would never happen. He'd say, no, well, in the future it is, and this is, you know. So there was this massive debate, and whenever I wanted to be the design, I'd bury it like about the fifth or sixth or something, and then when it would come with these, oh, that's a good one, we like that, you know. So Star Trek was made by committee, and that's not the way to make a movie. You really don't make movies by democracy, you know. It's, you need a captain of the ship as a vision, and then people who are all on that same uh, wavelength, and so... Star Trek was a movie made as a reaction to other movie and, you know, rebuilt with this collage of people. Tron was right from the beginning, uh, Steven Lisberger's uh, dream and idea and it had been developed. He was already starting to develop it before he ever came to me at Information International. And one huge thing, of course, that happened between Star Trek and Tron was computer simulation, the evolution of Tron was the film that was the firewall between the analog way of making films and all of a sudden using computer simulation, computer imaging to make all the craft rather than physical models. And all the things that computer simulation can do as far as visually creating something has no limits compared to what physical models and sets and things have. There's no limit to the physical limits to the objects, or there's no physical limitation to where the camera can go. Lights can go anywhere. You can have a light that's lighting something in the scene and you don't have a light bulb. You have the effect of the light. So all those kind of physical rules are gone. So uh, Stephen came in with some of his designs and um, he and I really were collaborative. And, you know, and I ended up being the co-effects director along with Harrison Ellen Shaw. And I also was the person that was responsible for directing and designing all of the computer simulation. And there were all kinds of ideas out there about what something looks like when it's computer-esque, you know, the kind of circuit board patterns and all those kind of things. And, uh, you know, I kind of started with all that and I just started inventing it. I've always been really good with rectilinear design and stuff. And so, and I had done the effects for Looker, uh, a Michael Crichton film at Triple I before Tron. And that was a science fiction movie. Everything that I did for the design that appeared on screens rather than being full screen negative. But there were two parts of Tron that took really unique. The way that we created the people in the electronic world, the, the glowing circuits on their bodies and all that, the technique for doing that was an evolution of what I had done at Ables with candy apple backlit, you know, while we were doing it frame for frame. You know, there's eight exposures for a person to be standing there, for one person to stand there in a frame. And it was all self-lock. It was a very labor-intensive. That was not computer-generated at all. But then there was everything that would have been models in a, in a traditional film that was now being done. You know, the light cycles, Sark's carrier, the tanks, the, you know, the solar sailor, all those things were all computer-generated. So I had a lot more freedom. I had a lot of freedom to do that. and. Um, and just by, uh, you know, as we were moving toward uh, the production, just the helmets alone, we had helmets and things, but they had no designs on them. And I would take a helmet at home at night and literally with chart pack tape and 
you know, uh, black masking tape and an exacto, and so I would do a helmet a night and take it back to where I sit here, and they go, "Oh my God, how did you make that?" And I said, "Oh my God." So uh, I just made things up as I went along, as you do as a designer. Um, but we kept a particular style, and then Sid Mead was a huge influence on the design, and Peter Lloyd was involved in doing uh, illustrations for what uh, the backgrounds and things would look like. Again, it was very collaborative, but it was a much tighter ship, and I was able to organize the special effects my way rather than in a, than a reactionistic, uh, you know, coming in and saying, no, that isn't going to work, and, you know, we, we really hit it off. So... It was very fun, and, um, you know, uh, I knew when we were doing that, we were making something nobody had ever seen before. Star Trek movie was an evolution of the television series, so there were pieces and parts that kind of came along as a part of that. Well, there was no precursor to Tron. It was the movie that uh, film to kind of try and visualize cyberspace. And it was very effective. Okay, well, listen, <clears throat> Richard Taylor... I want to thank you for coming on TrekPod and being a very special guest. And as you know, as I mentioned previously, we're celebrating or we're in the middle of celebrating the 40th anniversary of Star Trek, the motion picture. So thank you very much for what you did. And thank you for introducing the world to a magnificent version of NCC 1701. Uh, but again, Tony, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper too. Well, I hope you enjoyed that talk with Richard Taylor and I hope you found it very interesting. If you'd like to contact Richard and ask him any questions about his work, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. You can get his details from his website, which is Richard Taylor Design. Dot com, And you can also find him on Facebook, Richard Wynn Taylor 2. TrackPod has been brought to you from the United Federation of Podcasts, a network that brings you high quality podcasts. And we'd love you to check us out. You can find everything you like to listen to at ufp.earth. That's www.ufp.earth. All our podcasts are downloadable from Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Before I leave you today, I'd like to extend a very big thank you to our executive producers and founders. They are Ken Tripp, Zachary Moore, and Brandon Shea Mutala. These guys work tirelessly and very, very hard in the background to make sure you're getting top quality podcasts. Please join me again very soon with another exciting interview coming to you from TrekPod. Live long and prosper. You're off. You're off. This has been a production of MTMR Media Works.